when a lot of people I know heard that Sky had created this series called Dublin Narcos, they were actually going, no way. Yeah. yeah. Dublin? Yeah. But I mean, obviously they did Liverpool Narcos and uh, yeah, why not Dublin? Because Dublin was and is a drugs capital like any other. Um, It's a really interesting series. I've seen it. You haven't, Jess no. or Paul, even though you're on it. Uh, oh. But it's following basically the sort of drugs coming in to the city. Mm-hmm. And it's also following the trajectory of organised crime as it's growing. And there's a kind of in one ways, there's an innocence to each decade, each drug that comes, starting with heroin, moving to ecstasy and then cocaine. There's an almost an innocent from the users. But in the background, there's this very dark sort of large enterprise growing, yeah. Yeah. you know, and, and consequences for for the city as well yeah. As, yeah. as drug use grows and the business grows. Mm-hmm. And each time sort of each drug I think you see coming um, you hear from law enforcement. We hadn't a clue. We hadn't. We weren't prepared. We weren't prepared. But sure was anybody prepared? Anyone who took it. So look, let's start uh, with yourself, Paul. Dialing okay. into us from Goa, which we're all a bit <laughs> jealous of. You're there in the heat. We're only in the heat because of the lights <laughs> coming down on top of us in the studio. Right. But um, you feature in the in the first episode and in it, you describe yourself as one of the first users of heroin in Dublin. Now, that's incredible. You're 60 years yeah. of age, nearly 59. Yes, I'm yeah. 60 in August. Yeah. yeah, we'll give you the few months. Okay. So. Yeah, Just, I would have started at eighteen. Yeah, and what, what at that stage, Paul was heroin was where was it available? Like who was who was taking it in Ireland? Really, when it first arrived, there were some students out in UCD taking it, and then some guys that had been working in London and that uh, brought it home. And it first appeared kind of for public sale in Denor Avenue. Which yeah. is uh, it's amazing. Sweetest Gardens, and they were right down the road from my parents' shop. So it was a, it was a bit bohemian drug to a degree, wasn't it? When it when it first landed well, when in it Ireland, it originally arrived before it got as far as the flats. It was only a few students and uh, some arty types and that that took uh, heroin. It was a very expensive drug, and it was uh, it it wasn't known as yeah. such. Uh, so it was out in the Belfield Bar, I think, uh, earliest I've ever heard of it. And that would have been maybe about a year, two years before it got into the city. But then everything, Amazing. of course, changed rapidly as it as it hit the, the, the inner city complexes, flat complexes. Absolutely. Yeah, as I, uh, I saw in the trailer, which is the only bit I've seen of the, uh, of the uh, series, uh, of Dublin Narcos and where I said and I'd forgotten I'd said that because I said a lot so I don't know what they <laughs> used or what not but uh, I, we took to it like ducks to water Yeah, and we did and you sort we of describe I think on the show feeling this almost pink cloud surrounding you and that you, you just took this you didn't have a clue that this was going to be an addictive substance I, that was right, going to rule I'd your heard of I'd heard of heroin mm. from newspapers and from TV, but I didn't think this was actually that for some reason. I don't know why I didn't even question it. It was just called gear and they were, uh, but the syringes and all, you'd think I might have questioned it more, but I don't know. I was caught up in the excitement of, uh, I had been away for a few months hitchhiking over Europe at 18. And when I came back, all my friends were doing this thing called gear and I just wanted in on it, you know, mm. it's just the type of kid I was, you know. Do you I remember? Be in the middle of it all. Do you remember, Paul, how much it was costing you? Like, was it something that you were able to afford then, or did you? Know you... What? Yeah, when it uh, first arrived in Saint Teresa's Gardens, it was like uh, there was these little in the Basildon Bond, Belvedere Bond, or Basildon Bond uh, writing paper, that blue paper. They used to make the little packs out of that, and uh, they would be tiny little packs, and they would be ten pounds. So when we first used it, four of us put. A fiver each together. We got two of these little packs and we shared it out. And we shared it out amongst ourselves. Well, the lads did. I was just watching, fascinated. How did they even know how to do this and all? I had mm. so many questions, but really, I just wanted to see what the effect was, what they were all on about. So I was asking them, what's it like and all until we got it. And they were going, oh, it's, uh, oh you just got to do it. It's, you can't explain it. You just feel great. And 
you know, so it was just a, a bit of mystique about it. But as I say, yeah, it was just, uh, we just referred to it as gear. And I didn't actually know it was heroin. Not that it maybe would have made a difference. Um, I don't really think it would because as much as I'd heard of heroin, I didn't really know anything about it, mm. you know. Yeah. And did you use normally for a while, Paul, or were, did it quickly take over your your life? No, or... it, it took it took a couple of years. Uh, it took till I was twenty, uh, working in London, uh, where I went to get away from it. Ironically enough, I was. It was. It became mainly a weekend thing. But over the uh, space of a year, those weekends went from Saturday and Sunday till Thursday to Monday, and then Wednesday, and then you'd have two days feeling a little rough. Well, I wouldn't be, have been in the throes of addiction because I was young, strong, and I had a, I was able to recover quite quickly. I didn't experience really bad withdrawals until I got locked up in London uh, at 20. Mm. See, I'd got into trouble. I'd got into trouble um, with my family and that, you know, and, and at work and, and different things. I was a hairdresser and I was working in... Uh, uh, Peter Marks, and then I moved to Inner Visions in Black Rock when I came back from when I came back from uh, being hitchhiking around Europe, and uh, and then when I, I that's where I got into the gear, and uh, I was working in Black Rock in a, in a pretty exclusive salon, and um, I was using a heroin like say two or three times, and that went to four or five times a week by the time I left uh, the job, but it was just towards the end where I was getting a little bit. Um, it just came to light. My mother thought I was using hash, and I agreed I was because she knew something was up. I didn't want to tell her it was heroin, uh, so she suggested I, you know, to get out. She thought it was in the area and the guys I was hanging around with, but uh, so she wanted me to go to London to an aunt of mine, had, and said, "Why don't you try and get a job in London as a hairdresser? You know, you could, you could do well over there." And she just really wanted me out of the area, I think. So I agreed to go to London uh, to my aunt's uh, in Richmond, and I ended up. You know, until I got in my own flat, I ended up getting a job there in the West End. And I got a flat, and um, and that all went pretty well for a little while. But uh, again, I started using over there. I met a, a bus guy. I just had that kind of uh, obsession with this stuff. And eventually, when I came in contact with it, which I eventually would in London, um, I, things just went downhill from there. I after. I was working, doing really well in the salon. Um, I had a little flat. A few of the lads came over from Dublin. And I put them up and we all went using together and we just never stopped. And that place, we ended up in a squat down in uh, in King's Cross and we were all signing on the dole and using the money to buy heroin. And then we started to scam the dole because we saw that they, uh, they could keep, you, know, you could show them a birth certificate without a passport or anything. and, and enable you to open up another account another um i could say if somebody gave me their birth certificate from dublin i could open uh, a dole claim in their name you didn't need to pass a photographic id at the time and a lot of us were doing that and we had several birth certificates sent over from dublin and this was to keep our habit and but uh, things went from bad to worse that was a crazy time when i was 20 and actually got caught for that for defrauding the dole and i spent six months in uh, youth custody in Belton institution in uh, and presumably in Belton, were you were you using then in custody or did that give you time no, physically no, no. physically it, off it? Oh, I I had I had horrific withdrawals when I was uh, when I was actually arrested. We were taken to Bow Street's uh, police station in London, myself and another guy, and um, we were arrested outside the Dole office for uh, initially. I was on a motorbike I had bought because we had a um, we quite a little income, you know worked out at this stage and most of it went on drugs but uh, I was able to get an old motorbike which helped because I had to go around to six different dole offices every Thursday and pick up the dole. It was something that the Irish were doing en masse. It started with a few of us doing it and everyone heard about it at home and loads of people would come over and, and it was all a drug orientated kind of scam and scheme because everyone doing it was on the drugs and uh, yeah it was a bit of a crazy time and I ended up um, when I got arrested anyway, that's when I experienced the first really heavy withdrawals in Bow Street uh, Police Station. And um, that was horrific. I didn't know what was happening to me. It was like I had this really serious uh, flu, um, but my whole body was cramping and um, I was in pools of sweat and delirium. And 
I was shouting for a doctor or for some methadone or anything. And then eventually a doctor came after I signed my life away in statements. Uh, a doctor came in and gave me a tiny uh, codeine tablet that didn't even touch the sides, if you know what I mean. We it should set the scene here like, maybe, I suppose, a little bit as well and say this is the 1980s, sure. early 1980s. And Absolutely, back home in yeah. Dublin, we have a very, we have a very sort of, a, you know, divided city. We have a, a wealthy sure. upper class. The middle class yeah. are really sort of beginning to develop. But we have massive big housing estates and a lot of unemployment and it's bleak and it's quite depressing, yeah. Dublin. Even when you look back at the footage of it, it's a city that you can hardly recognize now yeah. for many reasons. Indeed. But um, when heroin arrived and, you know, largely the Dunn family would be linked to the beginnings of the heroin being offered for open sale outside your sort of bohemian group when it started becoming just available literally on in every flat complex, um, the Dunn's were you know, behind that and they were a lot of them were becoming very wealthy on the yeah, back of it. They were the first people probably to become super wealthy from the drugs trade in, in Dublin at the time uh, throughout the 80s. And they were a family kind of maybe Larry Dunn was the best known of them who only passed away last year. Yeah. And they I mean, at one point, obviously, he was able to buy a, a, a sort of a detached house on the side of a mountain, you know, mm. so it was, a, it was a different era. They were the first of the godfathers of crime, really, the Dunn's. Um, but there was money to be made from misery, really, which mm. is probably where drugs have always gone in one way. There is now this whole recreational population of drug users. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the heroin thing is always connected with that mm -hmm. underprivileged, isn't it? Yeah, hugely. I mean, usually, yes, yeah, usually, even though funny enough, it was the kind of arty crowd that got into it first. Or um, maybe survived it. But do, do you remember just that that, that, that that era of, of, of the marches against heroin? Because yeah. the community really fought back. Sure. Like yeah. I remember it myself, even just driving through town and you'd yeah. see guys at, at, at bonfires and things. Mm. Do, you, do you remember yeah. that time? And Yeah. I, I do indeed. And we, we just lived down the road from Trees' Gardens where there was a huge concerned parents uh, sort of um, association, if you want to call it. And uh, yeah, I would see them sometimes. I'd be up in uh, up in Fatima Mansions uh, scoring, and I would see them marching. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. for me, I mean, I, I mean, I started experimenting ecstasy when I was fifteen, sixteen, which was very, very young. You know, mm. I would have left school actually on the day of my junior cert. I walked out of school that very day, and um, for me, like heroin was very in the area at the time. I'm originally from Ballyfermas. So, you know, I had family members that were taking heroin and knew there was consequences to heroin um, and it was rapidly sold in our area. But it was something that I had no thoughts of and it was nothing to do with my life as such. Do you know what I mean? It yeah. didn't touch my door as such. But I, um, And did you, you so at that stage, XC, what, what year is that then? That's in the late 80s, is it? When yeah. it first it would have been, yeah, in the 80s. I mean, I didn't experiment ecstasy until at least the 90s. Yeah. You know, I mean, I was, I'd say about 15, 16 when I would have started messing around with, with alcohol and then it was hash and then it progressed to ecstasy. But that was because of the music. Yeah. I mean, there was only it was only being sold in at one point uh, mm. when it started three or four clubs also in, in Dublin, like there wasn't. But all of us again, Within a year, it was mm. it was everywhere. Maybe a couple of years. In my world and in my head, it was everywhere. Do you yeah, know what yeah, I mean? yeah. And, and that's just me, I suppose. Ecstasy kind of just done that, illuminated everything to be just massively big. You know? And I suppose it came along at a time when people were looking at heroin as that sort of. I mean, I've spoken to people who were living in areas where people would have been taking it. And, and as children, they were looking at what they saw as yeah. zombies walking mm -hmm. around. They could see the health effects, I yeah. suppose, that heroin was it. There was a very quickly a shame was attached to mm -hmm. that drug. There was a kind of like, you know, if you saw people, you saw deteriorating health, you know, mm -hmm. physically they were looking mm -hmm. bad. Whereas ecstasy came along. It was fun. It wasn't going to make you like that, was it? No, it was actually going to make you cool and it was going to make you look yeah. good. And I think the music again was part of that. Mm. The music just created a different energy and a different vibe and it became a magnet 
to the younger generation. And I suppose, you know, I have had family members that were affected by heroin and they have served time in prison based on, as you just spoke, you know, protests and those things on family members. Right. And that did affect their family. And, you know, they've served a lot of time based on, you know, charges that they were up against and stuff. And again, as you said, you know, shame and guilt attached mm. to that. But when the music started to play for us, it was their escape. Because we knew what was going on and mm. we knew what was going on within our families and in our communities. And as you said, it was the walking dead mm. to certain people because that's all you've seen was these like skeleton look people. And then HIV was mentioned, hepatitis C, all these names and stigma was coming and it was all mentioned. And yet the rave scene came and it was like a pop of colour. It was yeah. like it was like yeah. the rainbow of life, yeah. you know, trying summer of love. Like it, it was, was like a hundred yeah. percent. And you know, as he said, like, you know, just going back to what you said, there was two places in yeah. the inner city. Yeah. Um, I would have walked as a uh, contract cleaning for my father for many years, but we walked in Bewley's in Westmoreland Street and it was the best coffee, do you know. But that's where I used to get dressed and ready to go to the rave, you know, and it was literally over to the bridge. It was up the road, it was in the mansion house. And I used to take me E in the toilet when I'd finish walk. Mm. Before I'd be walking up the street, I'd be coming up on the E and, you know, the road just became bigger. Just felt like the road was moving and you'd be listening. The music was just a drawing. Yeah, you could yeah, really yeah. hear it, do you know, and it was possibly for me personally, it was the escape. It yeah. was the detachment away from anything that was going on around you. Yeah. And you just felt like you were. This is life, life and technical are there. It was. It was like some some way of becoming spiritually alive yeah. in a sense, because I suppose you were in the deprived areas. Valley Farm, it was quite poor at the time. Thankfully, I had a family that they were working class people. They always worked. Um, I've always worked every day, even as an addict. I would have always worked. I've always kept a job and held them down to a time. If it mm. wasn't doing criminal stuff, it was still yeah. a job. <laughs> I'm yeah, still yeah. working yeah. Um, and running. But um, yeah, like, you know, the, the rave scene for me was it was a, a genuine at the time. It was an act of love yeah. for us all as friends. We came together at Unity and that was the experimental stage. Because it didn't, it probably it, didn't last too didn't, long, did it? No, it didn't. Because and that was the introduction. It mm. was, you know, the invitation was quite um, fruitful is the only yeah. words I can say. But And how much then were you probably paying up to 20 punts for ecstasy, yeah. was it? Or 15, 20 punts at that stage? It would have been 15, 20 yeah, p- punts at that yeah. time. Because, I mean, I'm in that era where the money changed. And I remember. Yeah, I won't give me age away. No. But, um, yeah, like at that time, you know, I've said it when I was on the Narcos speaking about, you know, there was a time where, I mean, I was only a, a little fish in me little pond. Mm. And that's just the way I say it. I wasn't a hierarchy when it comes to criminality but I had my own issues and I done wrong things for to make money to keep me happy and, to do and just to things. explain that you ended up selling tablets I so you were yeah, a club goer you started yeah. off using and then you were you were selling tabs and you know as things developed really yeah. as that we talked with Paul there about the innocence in a way of the beginning of the heroin scene where it was a kind of a boho thing and then it just became a massive big you know pandemic nearly in the city wasn't it whereas the ecstasy it started as a party but very soon it's sort of you know you had the organised drug dealers coming in seeing the potential of it obviously having the ability to bring the stuff in from Amsterdam on you know in wholesale products and also they tried to attempt to make it here a few of them some of the significant dealers but they saw and they move with the culture, don't they? Yeah, 100%. Um, I mean, they seen something that was actually moving so quick within the city and money was coming in pretty quick. And for me personally, I would have just looked at it like this, very innocent, you know, in 16 years of age, you know, with me curly hair, yeah. you know, pro- proper 90s girl in a sense of all my clothes were illuminated, right. you know, colourful. and. I had a product and it was good and yeah, because it was like people there was you always heard pushers out and pushers mm. went to do with heroin. But of course, it wasn't like that when people were selling ecstasy because mm. there was a never ending demand, wasn't there? You weren't 
pushing it on anybody. Well, you, ha- you I had an experience with ecstasy that was the most beautiful feeling in the world. And again, I go back to the experimental stage yeah. of it, you know what I mean? And I wasn't one of those person. I'd always hold my hands up and say, like, I don't think ever think and anyone would have known me back in the 90s. I never actually took a full ecstasy. I was mm. always too afraid to because half of one was good enough. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It was like you broke in half. I popped it in and then I had to get a bit for later to bring me back up again. Do you know what I mean? But like that, I knew I had something that was so unique and so special. And I knew it was going to take someone on an absolute beautiful journey because it was after taking me on one. Yeah. Do you know, so I was very much on demand of saying, yeah, this is great. Yeah. You know, and would have introduced it that way to anybody. Exactly. So people didn't know. think I'm pushing something that's dangerous. Yeah. No, you yeah. thought, just, this is I'm, a I'm introdu- experience. Yeah, I'm going to introduce you to something you good. Know? And this is the thing when you look back and I suppose I can look back and I can say this now sitting here today by the grace of God. But... You know, when I look back on those pieces of my life, I can solely say that I was so naive, so innocent in Mm. it all. I didn't know the effects of even the come down of an ecstasy until I started to come down. Yeah. Because I'd be, oh no, and uh, Paul, you can relate to this, you know, you go out on a Friday night, you get stoned in a sense of an ecstasy. And, Mm. you know, you're 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 taking pills Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night. And then it's like then the introduction to heroin is given to you. Mm. And for me, it was like I was in a rave because, as I say, the rave scene happened when it happened. But then they eventually closed down. And that's what happened. And we went every area that we possibly could to have a rave, to have a party. We ended up up in Gallantstown, up at the Red Wall, yeah. in an in industrial estate that was actually not even fully built in, the, in regards to houses. And we went in and had sessions in there. And I remember one particular night I'm sitting there and I'm wired to the moon on the E, buzzing, listening to the rave music, dancing. And this guy is smoking heroin. And I'm looking at him thinking, He's coming down and mm. I'm way up mm. here on this buzz. And it's all that's in my mind is I have to get to work tomorrow. I have to be a mother to me kids. And how do I get off this high intensity buzz, you know? And that's where heroin was introduced. But again, it was introduced in a way where I knew what heroin was, but this was introduced as gear. This yeah. was introduced as smack. And again, I suppose you just wanted to block out the negative sides to. So it was going to slow down your your come down, basically, bring and bring you, you into a little bit of a gentle yeah, landing rather. Than, landing. Can I ask you both something? Right. And Paul, I'm sure you well, I'm assuming you experimented with many other drugs, right? I did. But, of course, uh, yes. So heroin is obviously your was was no, your love. It's the only thing I've ever had control of me. OK. I was pretty good with other drugs, you know, I could take or leave it. I, I, and like uh, Jesse, I, I used ecstasy um, as well at one point to try and get off heroin. But uh, mm-hmm. And I understand what she's talking about, about that uh, feeling of love and belonging uh, that ecstasy can afford us in the brain. Mm. But I have to say something there, guys, uh, just to let you know, on, on for someone that I did use actually for 35 years, I'm, I'm not mm. proud of that, but that's the truth. Um, I've never seen anybody pushing heroin. No. I've seen people hunting down a dealer mm. and chasing them all over town, but I never saw anybody pushing heroin on anybody. I'll ask um, you something else, right? Because this story sure. comes out a lot about, uh, you know, that there's supposed to be these these uh, dealers who throw free drugs <laughs> over walls oh, into nonsense. people's homes. Thank you. Yeah. I, I th- always think those sort of stories are ridiculous. Come I've on. never come across a dealer. And become an urban legend. Yeah. And mm. it's t- it took off as a scandalous exactly. kind of idea. Which There's it supposed is. to be dealers around world. West Dublin throwing, no, you know, free. Do you know, do you know Rick, you Richard Marx, who wrote Mr. Nice, he said, there's there's no supply and demand in drugs. There's just demand. And yeah. You can as long as you if you can supply it, the demand is endless. Yeah. yeah. So it's not really. But I, I suppose what I was saying with heroin was people made a distinction. And I think mm-hmm. they saw it as different. And then the new generation took mm-hmm. the took drugs. Mm-hmm took ecstasy, but yeah. it, they felt it was different and it wasn't going to lead to the consequences that that well, heroin had to the earlier generation. Absolutely. But I do think, you know, there was ex- an expression in in the sense of the music and in the dance and how we expressed ourselves and the confidence that we got from ecstasy just put us on another level. Yeah. Mm. Do you know, heroin didn't do that to that particular generation in the sense of like, you know, you wouldn't have went in stoned on heroin to dance because no. it was the ecstasy that kept you moving. Yeah, there was a whole dancing. culture. There was and, a yeah. total, yeah, and the music. And, but did you, was your sort of 
problem as regards what to leave behind? Was that the ecstasy or the heroin? Did the heroin become, did you become addicted? It's an addictive drug, obviously, but when you started using it, was the physical addiction something that you were able to overcome? Mm -hmm. Is an addiction, what I'm asking really both of you, is it, is it a sort of almost a spiritual love for this particular drug or do you have an addiction to all drugs? No, I, I definitely, I mean, there's all different types of models of addiction in regards to, you know, the mm. medical model of addic addiction. Doctors will tell you that there's, it's a disease and, you know, you'll always be addicted. I don't believe that to be the truth. I think that, you know, they're, you know, the way I look at it is, is this, I was chasing something. There was something in me that was missing. At that time, I was quite young. Ecstasy fulfilled that for a certain mm -hmm. time. And then I suppose for me, to come down off the ecstasy, I jumped obviously over onto the heroin. But again, the heroin done something different for me. Okay. And by that stage, for me, it had completely detached me away from my feelings and detached me away from my little world. And by that stage, I wanted to escape from certain aspects of my life because um, criminality had crept into my life. You know, and um, the people I was surrounded by, there was a lot going on. There was a lot that I was looking at that I wasn't really comfortable with. And heroin just removed some of that from me mm. and gave me just that sense of, you know, detachment. But I suppose there was another stage of that for me because it was experimental. And that was with heroin and that became a love that I was taking up for this drug. So I suppose answering that question to you is that yeah, there was a time in my life where, you know, I progressed to something different, mm. but I was open to all these types of drugs because it was just part of what we were doing. It was like there was there was rules and there was rules were definitely there to be broken to a point. But for me, it was like, you know, when I was taking ecstasy, the rule was that we wouldn't smoke heroin. Mm -hmm. We weren't to combine the two. And according to the people that I was around, that was not to be seen. And we were to hold up a certain. Yeah. And you speak about that in Narcos, about mm -hmm. the image that you were and, and how you looked. You were in the dance clubs mm -hmm. and you were selling tablets, but you had to look a particular way. You mm -hmm. were almost a marketing tool. Absolutely. You became a marketing tool mm -hmm. for ecstasy. The way your hair was, the way you looked, the way you were cool. You know, mm -hmm. people looked up to you. I want to look like her. Yeah. Yeah. And who did that? Was that, did you? Did did you do that or were you it was it somewhere that you were kind of working or was it your success as a dealer, as a I club think, dealer? I don't believe so. I just believe it was a genuine part of who, who I am as a person. I suppose I'm good at talking. I'm good at, you know, navigating certain things for certain people. I think that's why I'm very good at, as, as an addiction practitioner today mm. because of my lifestyle and my lived experience. But I bring that into every uh, elements of my life. But I suppose back then, the ecstasy gave me a huge confidence to be able to draw all things onto me in a sense of you feel so powerful when mm. you take it. It's like a cocaine buzz. It's a level of really like, you know, it just, you know, builds you up to that place. But but it didn't last nonetheless, did it? There was no. a honeymoon period. <laughs> yeah, for, there's always a honeymoon yeah. period. Mm. And that was like you spoke about coming down. Like, so you're, you're after a period of time the consequences are taken. It did. Yeah, the consequences. What was that me. like? Well, like in terms of your mental health and your emotional health, was it as well as yeah. coming down off the drugs and all all that? Well, I suppose coming down off E is, is, is very intense. You know, you're, you're coming down, you can be kind of still up and you're coming down and, you know, there's loads of things that are going on in your mind at that time. Um, but you want to come back to reality in a sense of just living your life and getting work done and getting, you know, being a parent and stuff. But I suppose the ecstasy side of things was that. And then the heroin for me became problematic. And um, I don't really can't really put a time frame on that. But I ended up taking methadone because I needed because I was withdrawn and, and those things. But the consequences of it was for me was that I was caught selling heroin and um, it was put down as intent to supply, even though I was buying it for my own personal use at the time. Um, I got three years in prison for that. I got a review after 13 months. Um, but I went on the run on the very day that I was due to be sentenced. And I ran to the UK and I got involved in all sorts when I went to the UK. So the consequences of that for me was a loss of myself, you know, um, 
you being a mother, I had to leave my children. I had to abandon them. There was huge consequences. And chaos. Know? Absolute chaos. I mean, I was, you know, in my early 20s, running out of a court in the four courts. Gillian Hussey had sent me forward for trial. Um, and I knew I was going to get maybe three years or more. Mm. You know, but the very day that I was up in court with my father and I shared this publicly when I done Tommy Tiernan in February last year and my dad was there. He used to run and I was gone. And for me, it was just like, where do I go? What do I do? The only place I feel like I go to was the UK because mm. I possibly come back sooner rather than later. But I went to the UK and I got involved in so much stuff in the UK that how I came back from it is an absolute miracle. Do you mm. know what I mean? So when I came back, obviously, um, you know, I went in, finished some of my time, got out on temporary release. Long story cut short, I then had conditions to that temporary release and that was signed the guard station and sign on up in the prison and their conditions that I didn't keep. Right. So I went lawfully large again and went on the run again. But by that stage, I was at the building up relationships within the prison mm -hmm. and meeting people that were in the business. And they always said, you want to come to the UK and make money? Here you are. So that's what happened on the second run. It was mm -hmm. like I'd made friends, made connections and I knew I could make money. Because and you became basically a drugs courier. Yeah, around the UK, yeah. I became a drug mule um, to, yeah, just got lost. In and that at lifestyle. that point, the party's over. Oh, it's well and truly over. I mean, the party's over for me big time. It was over a long time. There was times where I was so done, so tapped out based on my mental health, um, to be fair. But um, at that stage, I was just trying to survive and getting involved with what I got involved with at that time for me was genuinely just to be the habit. And were you, you know? at that point, were you trying to control your, your use of drugs? Was that going on in that time? Like, were you going, stopping taking them, coming back on yeah. them, all that type of stuff, mm. switching, yeah. switching drugs, drinking? I would have always, like, heroin was barely part of my life on a daily basis. I went as far as intravenous drug use. Um, that's how low I went to use and where there was a time where, I mean, I, I took drugs at one stage in my life. And that was when all the prison sentences were over. And, you know, when going back now 14 years ago today is that... I I took drugs because I didn't want to be in this world anymore because I couldn't deal with the guilt and I couldn't deal with the shame of not getting me life together and the stigma. That was around. 14 years ago today. Well, not today, but I'm 14 years in recovery right. um, Christmas Eve. Very good. So, yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. So it's yeah, it's it's one of those things where it definitely had a grip on me life for many, many years. The heroin did. Mm. And of course, I was on methadone for 12 years. Yeah, you know, um, which drives me insane to think that, you know, methadone was part of my life when it was should have been only a stabilization thing. And it was. Yeah. Did you go into uh, rehabilitation to come off methadone? I went into a treatment center in 2008 uh, to start my journey of recovery. And um, I went into a place called Victory Outreach. It was the only place that would have took me in 2008 because of the amount of methadone that I was currently on, which was 95 mils, a huge amount of methadone that was prescribed. I was daily smoking, daily injecting. I was taking all sorts of tablets, mm. antidepressants, weed, hash, alcohol. There was no stopping me use by that stage. It was like anything I could get my hands on to take. And why did you did you come to a decision? Did you have a moment where you thought, I want to try and change? I want to try and... I want to try and survive. I think it was in your yeah. case. Well, I, I think I was in survival mode and I was at a hugely loss of myself. And there was a time where, you know, there were so many people dying all around me that I was like, I knew that that was next for me. And I had this thought in my head that my children would be better off without me. My family would be better off without me watching me, destroying myself. So obviously I went to take my own life and I had a beautiful encounter in a church um, 14 years ago, which was in my own local area where I went in to decide I'm going to die specifically here. Yeah. I'm going to inject these drugs and I had a little note. I had everything prepared, you know, because I was done and I just couldn't live another moment in this mm -hmm. world. My mental health wasn't good at all. Like the only way I can explain where my mind was, it was like a two dike and it was suicidal thoughts every couple of minutes. It mm. was just like die, die. And that's where it was. And I went into the church to light a candle for my children and to light a candle for my mother and father and just to kind of my way of saying sorry. 
and a lady in the church walked over to me and she placed her hand on my shoulder and she said to me, light a candle for yourself. And I had a moment where I paused, looked at her and just connected to my heart and I didn't really want to die. Yeah. And I just had a moment in that church with God that just changed my life. And, and I went to the treatment. Kind words, somewhat of a stranger, yeah. like, I mean, yeah. it just shows how we the should The profound be. word of yeah. kindness of a, a stranger. And it really, really was. I mean, that lady, I mean, she doesn't know it today, but she saved me life. Um, you know, how broken I was when I walked into that church. But there was a brokenness in me that also wanted to be fixed but I didn't know how to get there. And what did you hear from her that day that you were worth it? I, it was like the love from a kindness. It was the profound word of a, of a mm. kind person that literally when she placed her hand to my shoulder, she touched me in such a way that I needed that touch, that hug and that of that just to be there, you know, mm. that I was seeing mm. more than anything, Do you know, because I just felt like I was floating around a place and no one was actually seeing me. And she took time out of just to, just see, to see me there and to say, you know, those words to me. And I just remember standing in that church and I, I shared this also on the Tommy Turning show that I, I just looked up at Jesus on the cross and, and I looked around at every crucifixion and I was overwhelmed with what I was seeing because it was me mm -hmm. carrying me cross through my life, through my journey. And that's what I envisioned in my mind and in my heart. And then I seen our Lord on the cross and it just felt like I was going to give up. And it was just my story came alive mm -hmm. to me and I had that beautiful moment there. And I walked out of that church and I had before I'd gone in, <laughs> I had the gear cooked up in her in the needle ready to inject it. And I threw those drugs away when I left that church and I still not knowing what I was doing, didn't know where I was going. And then I went into that treatment center in 2008. And I stayed with them for six months and it was a Christian program and I left there and then I went to another Christian program, which was in Teen Challenge. Um, and I went to Bible college and I started to just incorporate the experience that I had in the church into my life. And it was all about love and belonging and acceptance. You know, which probably brought you right back to where you started and with the did. ecstasy, actually, yeah. you know, you said you were looking yeah. for something. Well, and of course, spiritual mm. experiences have been a part of recovery like that's been noted that that's that's how people re require profound spiritual experiences yeah. for change. Yeah. Paul we left you when you were 21 in London let's go back and talk to you about where you went next. Please. Okay can I just say something on what you're talking about when I look back at my, my my life I don't see it as a problem with drugs I see it like a spiritual problem because that was the solution but I didn't know this at the time but I've always been in a spiritual seeker, you know, mm. uh, even right through my addiction. I was always reading metaphysics and I was trying to get some sort of grain of truth. But it was a very dark place. So I think drug addiction is a spiritual kind of problem mm -hmm. because if you can't be good in your spirit and stick drugs into your arm, mm -hmm. um, there's a great deal of uh, self non-acceptance mm -hmm. going on. And I think the solution is in self-acceptance. And so I would say the whole thing is a very spiritual journey for myself, you know, especially when I got off drugs in the end. Which was, but, um, so just bring us back to London when you're 21 and where you go to next, because I think you, what happened to you? I went to Germany. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, I, when I came out, my mother met me outside the prison and we came home to Ireland and I got a job and found myself getting into the same nonsense again so i went off to germany and i worked over there for a couple of years um well say like about 18 months without any you know not on the heroin and that was a clean time i had and i got into my career and i worked doing the hair for film and not but i got into ecstasy over there in a big way at that time in the time where i wasn't actually um, using heroin and uh yeah i have to say a friend a couple of friends came over from Ireland um, and a pal of mine came over and he wanted to get off the heroin so he brought something from London he was living in London at the time he came over and visited me in Munich and I put him up for a couple of weeks to try and let him go through the cold turkey and um, to try and help him get off but he brought a little bit of gear with him and it was Christmas Eve when he, he was trying to cut himself down to wean himself off and I used the last little bit with him uh, on Christmas Eve and uh, anyway, he didn't last a couple of days with no gear and he flew back to London uh, 
panicking to get something else because I at this time I had no connections in Munich, but um I'd had a taste of it then and I didn't think too much about it. But in come that I don't know that summer or something, he rang me and told me that he had uh, he'd got you know he found out he had HIV and I said like Jesus, bro, you know in fact back then it wasn't called that it was called AIDS mm. um and uh, I said what about me we used together at Christmas and he said oh no I think I got it after that. So I always told myself, oh, I'd be okay. You know, he got it after he left me. But I didn't want to accept the, the idea that I could have that too because that was a, a bona fide death sentence back then. Mm. And uh, at some point later in that year, I sprained my wrist. And uh, I was in Hamburg at the time on a job there. And they, I went to the hospital and they asked me if I wanted to make a test. And I thought, I was thinking of what happened to my, my friend in London. I was thinking, yeah, okay, I will. And uh, and that came back, um, that went through, and that came back positive. And so that was a life changing uh, moment, you know, for me. Like, and you were what age then, through. Paul? I was 21, 22, sorry, 22. 22 years of age. And that was at mm-hmm. the height of the AIDS scare all and yeah. all of that, and that this was a death sentence. And absolutely, your I reaction like to that was what? To, to get spiritual I I or to just. Up. <laughs> Live all life. ambition went out the window yeah. that I had at that time. Mm. All ambition, all I hadn't, uh, all ambition, all hope for the future, all my dreams went out the window. And I just thought, thought, well, I'd rather have two years on my terms than five years, as I was told, if I looked after myself. Mm. So that's the, uh, that was the attitude I adopted right then. So did that actually and, uh, bring you right back into a very serious heroin addiction because it was on your terms and you decided you're going to live yeah, it, it up basically. It did. Mm. You know, at the time I was doing really well in my career and I was playing in a band in Germany uh, and uh, we were doing really well and everything that I always wanted to do was kind of coming together and then I found out about that and uh, everything just went out the window. Mm. Everything just went out the window. I just went on a mad one. <laughs> and did you blame, you know, did you have any blame towards like you know, it, it's a death sentence no, essentially no, back no, then. No, I didn't. Come here, listen, let me tell you, no. And I'll tell you as well, people mention, oh, it's terrible that you've been a victim of this addiction. I was never a victim. I was a willing participant in my addiction. I dove in head first and I take responsibility for every bad thing I've done. And I did a lot of them on heroin. Mm. And, um, you know, I, I was not a victim. Some people might be because of social circumstances, situation, or they could have parents that were into it or whatever. But I was never a victim. I was just uh, an out of control person who didn't like myself and was willing to do anything for. Uh, but that would give us an impression that you had a choice. I did have a choice. I always had a choice. But let me tell you, when you take heroin for a couple of years, you don't have a choice anymore. Once that gets into your into your soul, like that, I was listening to Jess there. She was saying the effects of um, the E and that. But the thing is about heroin. And, you know, hell can take you over in an obsession and all. But with heroin, it takes your soul. It takes your, if you didn't have a spiritual problem when you started it, you will have one when you're, well, when you're on it. That's for sure. Because it takes your ability to feel away. Mm. And when you can't feel, all you can do is think. And that is hell in itself. And so and I can't just feel things. You can't feel. So you can't deal with anything emotional at all. Because your emotions are shut off to you. Your only emotions are sentimental, stuff from your head. There's nothing from your heart when you're on heroin. And you might have the best intentions in the world, but it's all mental stuff. It's all head. It's a, it is a spiritual malady. I totally believe that. So, Paul, did, at what point did you did you come to a rock bottom then? At, at some point, yeah. obviously, or was there multiple rock bottoms? Or was there of still... Of course, a- yeah, there, there was multiple. There was multiple... Um, it was multiple, and I, I guess you, you keep thinking it's your rock bottom until you fall lower. Um, mm-hmm. So I guess it all accumulated um, really just before, you know, I got through years and years of it with various rock bottoms and so many attempts at different treatment centers all over the world. And I say all over the world because I traveled to Thailand with nothing basically in my pocket. I went to a monastery there. Uh, I spent time in a the monastery there that, um, 15 years ago. I went to, uh, I was in Patriarch in, in, in France. I was in Sinanon in Berlin. I was in Israel in the treatment center for four days. Uh, you know, it just goes on and on. They're just the foreign ones. I also was in, um, I was in, 
nearly every treatment centre except Cool Mind for some reason or other. In although I did do their day program, so even they're not, <laughs> you, you know, I did do their day program. But I've been in every residential in the country, and some of them a couple of times. Do you have any understanding uh, why those rehabilitations, etc., never worked for you? Um, because my trauma was so repressed in me. My sense of self and my sense, my lack of self acceptance, that I could never um, completely let go and uh, face the the deep uh, inherent truth that I didn't actually like myself. Like I, I found that very difficult to look at, and uh, I probably resisted Nicola. I probably resisted a lot. Um, I did try, and I did get sometimes a few months here and there, but the obsession was huge in me. And don't forget, I had lived a, a various amount of years, you know thinking I was dying. And it wasn't until I started hitting 30, I think, how come I'm still alive? And, yeah. you know, and I would still, I would make several attempts to, uh, I would make several attempts to um, get clean. So do you right mean in, like by that, 50s, that did. you didn't like yourself enough to let yourself get better, if that's what you call it? Uh, yeah, I didn't expect myself. You, you know, I found, because that, I, and I didn't realize this always at the time, but it's it's kind of in with hindsight I can say that that uh, I I don't know I was out of control I had a manic type of mind and uh, I would just be always up for devilment and always up for something exciting like when you take heroin so often are you like I said you live in your head not your heart so everything coming from your head is just a nonsense a feeling is a sense a thought is not a sense it's a nonsense. That's the way I look at it. And so I lived in that nonsense for years. And uh, I would go into a treatment centre and I would think I was the smartest person in there. And, you know, I don't know what they're talking about. I've actually lived it. This is just a counsellor. And I would pick holes in everything. It was just because it may be an inability to look at myself and my own behaviour at the time. And were you always like that or was it because you lived so long? I mean, you're, you've you lived so long with the heroin addiction. I don't know. Yes, I have. Is I there know, many you like know, you? I, uh, have I lived? I, to be quite honest with you, uh, I, and when I say this, you know, I'm. I was going to say uh, I'm not your typical addict, but what I mean by that is I'm not the archetypal addict who's, uh, you know, never left the country. I've travelled a, a lot extensively and did work through most of my addiction over many years. It's only up until about 15 years ago that I ceased to uh, work anymore. Being a hairdresser, it's a physically demanding job. Because mm. you stand up all day and sometimes you go without lunch when you're busy and that's just the way it is. And I just wasn't, my body just wouldn't take that anymore. And uh, so, you know, I did work through a lot. I was as functioning an addict as you could be at one point, even though I had, uh, and then I would, things would slip and always get worse. And I'd find myself in a bad situation. I'd pull up out of it, go to treatment, I'd come out, I'd do well, I'd get a job, and boom, before you know it, I'm on, and I could be on the rocky road again, but. This time I'd be trying to manage it somewhat, and that might take a few years before all the house of cards fell down again. Mm. Well, yeah, that's the way it was. It was uh, just an ever, never-ending struggle of multitude of treatment centres, counsellors, all of that. At the end of the day, after doing the rounds of anywhere and everywhere that might have helped me, I ended up uh, really just, I suppose, I lost both my parents five years ago uh, when my mother just before, or just after, actually, I uh, started to get clean, and, and my father just before that. And, um, you know, uh, but they are very meaningful in my life today. It's a kind of me trying to pay homage and respect and, uh, and to live. Um, and I have a beautiful daughter, I should say, as well, because when I started on the triple therapy at, um, about 25 years ago, they told me that it would be uh, the best time to have a daughter. And I was in a loving relationship with a girl at the time so we decided to go for it and we hit the target first time um, when my bar load had uh, dropped so um, below uh, below a detectable level which meant it was uh, if it's non-detectable it's non-transferable and we got that information early on and we have a beautiful daughter I'm not with the girl but uh, me and my daughter have a wonderful relationship so this was another aspect of something that came into my life that I wasn't expecting and um, I you know, uh, things, and as I've seen her grow into a beautiful young woman, I did want to live for her. At this stage, I've been using years, and well, I keep trying and trying and trying. And I only cracked it four years ago, but um, I had a huge experience, which um, actually 
I'll tell you how I got off heroin. I'll tell you now because it looks like they're closing this bar. Yeah, tell us quickly so, uh, before they do. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I did ayahuasca. It's a visionary plant from South America. I did a lot of reading on it. And uh, because always I could get off, I could go through the, the pain of withdrawals, but I could never stay off because the obsession was always strong. Mm. So I had read about ayahuasca and how it helps multitude of people. And I managed to source it in Ireland. And uh, I did, went to an ayahuasca ceremony, took the herbs, I had a visionary experience, and I haven't used uh, opiates since. Everybody obviously so, has a different, you know, yes, experience what or whatever to come off. But I want to ask you both while you're still on and while they're still serving drinks there mm. in Goa, just both of you, um, the kind of work I suppose myself and Niall do is all focused on the dealers, the people who are making sure. money out of all this. And we always describe it about these sort of greedy people making money out of other people's misery. Yeah. Do you feel that? Uh, it's just human nature, isn't it? There's money to be made. Someone's going to jump in and do it. And if some guy, some criminally minded guy doesn't mind what he does for a living, uh, um, he's going to sell drugs, you know, if he doesn't have any scruples about it and if he can make money and if he's good at it. Not everybody can be a successful drug dealer. It takes uh, fortitude, it takes smartness. It's really, uh, idiots don't make good uh, dealers. Now, mm. I'm not saying they're all intelligent people, but a certain amount of smarts is needed to be a good dealer. And I think even Jeff might agree with that. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't have... Um, uh, absolute idiots they wouldn't last very long well they may not be idiots but would you feel would you have any sense of them i suppose feathering their nests becoming very wealthy well, on I'd the be kind aware of that they do because i've seen it from every level i've mixed with the top dealers uh, i mean i'm not talking about the top dealers, uh guys who you don't hear of in the paper uh, mm. and the street level dealers that's one thing about my life i've it's uh i've been able to walk through the flats and i could also uh, have dinner in Fox Rock in the friend's house. It's just the way it went in my life with the career I chose and stuff. But I will say that uh, I was never bitter about that. I have too much to worry about, about my own spirit. And soul. Mm. I wasn't concerned about who's making money and what or bitter about that. I spent what, probably two houses up my arm. And I, you know, I let that go because I got my soul back, you know, mm -hmm. better than I ever had it before I ever took drugs. So, uh, that to me is more important than anything. I never give any thought to that kind of thing. I do hear people saying, oh, those bastards are taking all our money and getting rich off our misery. And I don't go along with that narrative. There is truth to that, but I don't concentrate on that stuff. Mm. I concentrate on where I'm at today mm -hmm. and what my input is to those around me and the people I love and uh, to try and live a loving, care, a loving and caring life. I'm all about kindness today. I'm a big believer in it as a potent force and needed in the universe. As I'm an older man, I realized those in my darkest times, the people I remember are the ones that were kind to me when mm. I was really broken and destructive. And uh, th these were the people that uh, really stand out, that really made me, gave me the encouragement to go on when I thought I couldn't. And uh, the way, you know, I thank, and they may not even know they did something for me. They were just kind to me when I was mm. at my worst. And, uh, you know, that's the kind of stuff I kind of concentrate on now. I don't really, I know there's people making money and from other people's misery and there is all that, but I don't have the time personally to, to give to that kind of stuff. And Jess, maybe you were kind of nearer the kind of communities that were affected mm -hmm. in large, but how do you feel about that? Well, I suppose, uh, you know, for me, looking back on, I suppose, my lived experience of dealing drugs when I did, um, you know, there there was money and there was wealth in that. Um, but again, it's only temporary. Again, it doesn't last forever. Mm. And again, it didn't sit with me, you know, and I'm grateful that, you know, when I was before the judge, before the courts, um, it was an act of genuine, even though I went on the run, but in somewhat ways I surrendered in myself because it didn't sit well with me. Mm. And maybe because my core beliefs have been you know, I've come from an honest family. And so you see yourself as that. I would see mm -hmm. the kind of the, the bigger, the, the more sort of overlords, I would see the people mm -hmm. who are making the real money out of all this industry. Mm -hmm. Do you have any feelings about them? I mean, we'll see on Narcos, the likes of the Duns following in to the ecstasy years where actually a lot of the big dealers aren't named, but maybe never were. Yeah, but I mean, probably most drug dealers are operating out of their own trauma. Possibly. I mean, everyone has their own story, but I suppose 
you know, just in what I said for me, it was, you know, it didn't sit right with me and whether it sits right with them, that's on them mm. and they're accountable for their life and they're accountable for what they do, you know, and there will be a time that they'll have to go looking for forgiveness at one time in mm. their lives because they will go before God for what they're doing. I certainly did, mm. you know, and for me, I feel like that I have forgiven myself um, and people around me have forgiven me, my family, and that was more important to me and I had something to work for in my recovery and mm. that just didn't and stop so me. much to give now absolutely i mean today i mean i'm honored to do the job that i do as a, an addiction practitioner and have a lived experience and the qualifications to go for jobs in which i do today and i do it quite naturally to help people within my community i can navigate so much for people because i know people um, people know me and, you know, there's a network of good mm. supports out so, there. So say, Jess, you, you spoke about uh, being on methadone and only being able to go into one treatment centre. Like, what do you think of the level of the, the, the role of the government? I mean, are they making addiction services available? Is there funding? Is there help for people if they need it? The help is there, but the, I suppose you look at the criteria that are out there at the moment. I mean, for one, I can say there isn't enough treatment centres. There's not enough beds out there for people to access treatment. And it's always been a massive frustration for mm. me to try and support someone into a bed. Again, there's always um, criteria. All criteria to all treatment centres are all different. And um, whether they have to reduce, which we understand, they have to reduce before they go in. But again, somebody could be on prescribed medication. Somebody could be on epilepsy tablets, which they probably need all the days of their life. Yep. But if they're getting those, say, oral meds are injected, some treatment centers will say, well, we don't take them in on injection, but they'll take them in. So it's always finding treatment center to cater for that particular person, which is a lot of work to do. Um, but again, that step that that person has solely made to a service like ours could be the biggest step of their life. And then there's a barrier put up with no, because of that medication you're on. Mm. So I suppose, yeah, there isn't enough beds. Yeah. The government need a good shake yeah. in regards to their policies, in regards to what they need to be doing in regards to recovery. It was actually wonderful to hear the news. I don't listen to it much, but I did the other day and they were saying that they were putting out funding on the table for people for, with cocaine that were struggling. And that's only because I believe, you know, you look at the different tiers of people that are taking cocaine now, it's not just it's everywhere. It's like, everywhere. Yeah. So it's like they're putting the money on the table to support people today based on who's taken it. I believe it's not just Bobby from down the road there. It's because minister, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, well, it's in be. rural Ireland. <laughs> if it, yeah. Once it hits rural you Ireland, know what I mean? so it's, it's like a different matter. It'd be a nice a suggestion to be saying, well, look, at, you know, there's treatment centers that are there that are not funded mm. Um, put the money in and yeah. fund them. You know, get people that are working in that have come from addiction, lived experience, have the qualifications to run these centers and support these people. And, you know, people that have come through college, get them invo involved in these type of services. They have the pilots to do it. They have the people to do it. They have the resources to do it. They just need to make it work and they just need to put these things out there. I mean, I, I get so frustrated when I'm at home and I put the TV on. I'm not a TV person, to be honest, but uh, the ads on the telly will come on. And you'll see a washing up liquid ad <laughs> and you're going, imagine if they put air service on that ad yeah. mm -hmm. and they promoted air service and they spoke about the supports that are given as a commercial ad instead of, you know, head and shoulders and Brennan's bread. Like, what is the point of it all? The money that has been invested out there stupidly that, you know, it's just it's so sad to see people. I mean, even coming down here today. Mm you know, walking down the street as we go out of the taxi. Yeah. The people that are out there at the minute that are are dying on air streets because they cannot access a treatment service. Absolutely. It's and shocking um, and it breaks my heart. Um, and probably most of those people you're talking about wouldn't be allowed into treatment centres because they, they might be on too methadone. Many yeah, they're they homeless and they don't have any sort of structures no. around them. and. So they are yeah. reliant on really on charity organisations because the state don't don't mm. step in and do it. No. And then again, you look at the, the ones that are non-funded organisations are doing massive yep. and impactful work 
within the people. I mean, I came from treatment centers that were non government funded, yeah. and I'm standing today because it was a spiritual program. And because you gave you somebody gave, gave you a them. chance, yeah. Yeah, and that's the difference. Do you know what I mean? And how important is family and that support network around people? Because there's families out there who have an addicted person living with them um, and they are fed up because people mm -hmm. just get fed up of the same thing happening again and again. Mm -hmm. Maybe they're stealing from them. You know, they're promising everything and, mm -hmm. you know, then they go back into addiction. But, you know, they say people in prison having a visitor, just having one person mm -hmm. from the outside who still loves them. How important is it for people who are just really failing to mm -hmm. see any way mm -hmm. that this isn't the case that like would you say to them, just stick with it, hold with that person, just stay with them? Well, I suppose it's like everything else. I just know from me when I took those steps into recovery, I know my parents and my children went into recovery also. Mm. So for me, stepping away, it allowed them to recover over a period of time. But they still had that concern that I was going to ring at any given moment and I was going to say I'm leaving and I'm gone because that's what they were used to. They didn't. I suppose they had that belief that, yes, that's my daughter and that's whatever. But, you know, I was that many years using that. I think their hope was nearly gone, you know, but that changed for me over those periods of phone calls when I made a decision to say, no, I'm enjoying what I'm doing here and I'm finding myself and I'm accepting myself and the love and belonging of self now. And what I've gone through in my life has dramatically changed in my heart. Um, and then you get acceptance from the family and they start trusting you and then they're ringing you and those calls are coming through at the time that you put requests in for those calls. And, you know, it's, it just does something to your spirit and your heart and you just feel that love again and you want to prove yourself to these people. So everyone needs someone that loves them, really. 100%. And particularly going through something as difficult as coming out of addiction. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's, it's trauma that puts us all into addiction. I mean, we don't take drugs because we, we want to experiment. We take drugs because we simply want to escape reality. That's the truth of it. We want to escape some type of pain or trauma that's in our lives. Mm. And I suppose when the drugs are removed, all the new things start to present itself, whether it's ADHD or bipolar, these things could have been there at the very, mm -hmm. very beginning. But again, it's only when you take the Yeah, drug. people have no hope of coping with these things yeah. while they're in the mix of mid middle of active mm -hmm. addiction. And then, you know, they, if people can't cope with how they feel, people turn to drugs. But yeah. when the mm -hmm. drugs are removed, the people... New things present themselves yeah. to, mm. to a point, you but, know. But of course, it takes people time to, to recover, doesn't it? Like, it did. It did for me. I mean, I was 12 years on methadone and I was nearly 14 to 15 years using heroin. Um, and for me, you know, I had gone into a treatment center where I came off 90 mils of methadone and all those drugs. And I went into a, you know, psychosis in a sense coming off because I put my body into absolute shock. And um, I mean, I didn't know what was real and what wasn't real mm. when I got clean. There was a time where I remembered my experience of one day walking down the road, going through withdrawal and the wind blew me. And the, the force of the wind blew me back and I was shocked that the wind blew me. I was shocked that the ground was so tough and so hard because I was too busy when I was strung out and on drugs. I was bouncing around the place and I didn't know my surroundings. I was just like plowing through life. So, you know, those little things, those little fears coming back into your life that this is real, that wind mm. is real. And they were probably, you know, talking about them now. It's funny. But back then, for me, this was like real stuff. And it was, you know, tough <laughs> yeah, to kind yeah. of deal with the normal living day. And your feelings, your yeah. feelings were the toughest thing to push through constantly, you know. But it's huge, huge acceptance. And I'm very grateful for the program that I went into um, because we would have had class every single day. And uh, this was a non-charitable organization and it was Teen Challenge to Glynn today. Um, but we done a class one time and it was called Loving and Accepting Yourself. Mm. And it was one of those classes where I was sitting there with a lot of guilt and a lot of shame. Mm. And to be honest, um, this process into this chapter of what I'd done in my life allowed me to look at myself hugely different. And I was able to let go of past issues, past traumas and really accept myself by who I really was. So that was significant for me. Yeah. You know. Yeah, because mm. nobody ever guilts themselves into, no. into being well. 
Paul, you need to leave Isn't us now. Just tell me now, have you any have you any final thoughts for us that you 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 know about your own life, your addiction, your your currents, you know where you are now? Um, yeah, my my life has taken a miraculous turn since I got a uh, thing. I can just tell you very quickly. I started doing a YouTube channel during the pandemic, something to do mm. because uh, just to, to keep myself occupied. I'd had a full year behind me at that stage when the pandemic came full year clean which was as long as i'd ever had before i started doing a youtube channel called cold turkey and uh, i went around interviewing homeless people who were suffering with addiction and then i went on to do the heroin chronicles in in my uh, on my channel and that led to me getting onto the blast film uh production narcos dublin and uh, led to me coming out here to to write my book and my life has taken a a completely unusual turn, mm. but it's something I'm quite peace, at peace with. I don't mind telling my story and telling it as honestly and openly as I can. Um, my final thoughts are, yeah, I, drug addiction for me was, uh, I was never a victim. I was a willing participant when I could be until I lost choice to the drug and to the addiction. And I, um, I found my way out of it. Um, not that the treatment centers didn't work. I just wasn't able to engage and work their program. Um, but I found a way out. I've been four years opiate free. Um, and that's off methadone, uh, suboxone, anything with an opiate in it. And of course, heroin. I don't take hard drugs. Um, so I, my life, yeah, at the moment, I have a great piece of my life that I fought very hard for. Um, and, uh, like I said, I'm just grateful to be here, to be able to share my story uh, for those that care to listen to it. And uh, thanks for having me on. You're very welcome. Thanks are you going to, your Heroin Chronicles, are they going to be published online or? Uh, no, book? I'm hoping to publish it as a hardback copy. Excellent. Will you come back on when that happens for you? <laughs> I certainly will. I certainly will, Nicola, yeah. Okay, Paul, thanks, thanks, thanks a million. Thanks for coming on tonight. From Not at all. Uh, India, and, if you uh, don't Jessica, mind. Wow. best of luck with you, Thank Jessica. you. Uh, Cheers. What are Welcome. your thoughts on the drug scene at the moment and what's happening at the moment? Is it, do you feel it's the same? Do you feel people who are, I suppose, now a days taking cocaine, mm -hmm. are they doing it for the same reasons that you took ecstasy, that Paul took heroin, that are, you know, is it becoming more and more usable because we're becoming richer? Probably that, yes, that we're becoming more richer. Um, again, cocaine is, I mean, I haven't took cocaine in many, many years. I mean, I'm in sobriety 14 years, so I wouldn't know what the drugs taste like today, but I do see the effects of them because I work with clients mm -hmm. on a daily basis. And I do explore this piece with a client when they come in. And it's like everything else, whether it be weed, crack, cocaine, the drug being the drug, the come down from the drug is absolutely jaw dropping because the come down is horrific. You know, um, do you I mean, even mean somebody out taking a couple of lines yeah, on a night out? Yeah. yeah, like, I mean, I don't even know what a couple of lines even looks like today for mm. people. I mean, well, no. it's supposed to be extremely pure, they say. Yeah. And I don't even know what that looks like in the sense of when them lines stop. Yeah. Or how long them lines are. And that's what I mean. And how long those hours go on for that person, whether it's bag or it's an ounce or it's a gram mm -hmm. or whatever that looks like. It's just that when I work with somebody that's coming off, come down from cocaine, it's quite emotional. It's a roller coaster. They don't know what's real and what's not real because they've been so much high up mm. on a very high buzz with the, the cocaine, you know, and whether that be with weeds, you know, they're caught up in the buzz of that. And it's like everything else, you know, you buy cigarettes today and there's a warning sign on the cigarettes and there's a mouth with teeth falling out and probably mm. all black jaws and whatever is on it. It still doesn't stop them from smoking. But I've always looked at drugs going because I know the consequences to drugs and I've always looked at drugs now as just being a consequence. <laughs> so, I mean, if we were to stand there and say, you know, I'm selling coke today and yeah, you're going to be paranoid. Yeah, you're going to owe a bill out. Yeah, you're going to have debt. Yeah, you're going to lose your family. And would it be looked at differently if it was promoted in such a way? But it's not. It's promoted in such a way that this is the best thing alive. And that's what any drug out there. So I suppose if the demand for that kind of thing is the thing, it's going to always be there and sold. And it's what I love about social media at the moment is, is that people and TikTok is another way of, 
you know, people talking about recovery very openly because they're starting to talk about the consequences of using. Mm. And that's what I enjoy that part is that that's good to hear a positive on social media. Yeah, yeah. but yeah. this is what I'm saying for me in a sense of recovery. It keeps you very grounded in a sense, even where I, when I work with people daily or chat to them, I'll always talk about that time when they used. Did they have that experiment? that it was good Mm -hmm. or experienced that it was good or did they fully regret in the middle of using that that's not what they wanted to do do you know what I mean because the reality of it is is that I I just look at drugs just completely different today um, only because I I see a consequence you Mm. know um, and there is consequences for it you know um, so maybe there isn't in some ways enough uh, there is a lot of talk of the consequences of drugs in, in the media in general but maybe not enough talk of the consequences of recovery where mm-hmm. people's lives really can be transformed. Absolutely. You know, that mm-hmm. that it's not mm-hmm. it's not a, a, a life sentence becoming addicted becoming addicted if mm-hmm. you stop that because you, do, you yeah. do see, I presume, incredible stories of recovery in, in, mm-hmm. in your work. Yeah, hugely and, and they're the testimonies of, you know, how good um recovery can be for somebody. Um I'm in a very new relationship myself um just he's just become the hero of my heart to be honest Mm. and his name is terry but he does um testimonies with terry and he's on youtube Mm. and i'm i'd be one of those guests that he invited on to that show um last year and he opened this up during COVID times talking to people openly about their addiction and it's been just a powerful platform Mm -hmm. to be open and to share because you see this one picture of somebody you know, strung out to bits and then you see this beautiful picture of somebody that yeah. has redeemed their life and got themselves together but talk about the hardships of, mm-hmm. because that's the piece that's always missing is that the process to it mm-hmm. of getting clean and the hard times to do it and to keep going and that's what needs to be spoke about a little bit more, you know, um, because there's never really a light shown on that, mm-hmm. that the work is done daily, Yeah, you know. Um, and that even the bad things can can be a benefit to people in the long run. Absolutely. I mean, every experience is, you know, somebody else's stepping stone and it just helps them. Recovery meetings work for people. I personally don't do them. Um, I go to church every Sunday. I'm Christian. Um, I follow this new way of living. Um, my accountability is genuinely before the Lord in my heart because it keeps me. Um, I need it. Um, and it just keeps me grounded. Um, I fabulous skin. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry, it's just unbelievable. Is it? Thank you. Yeah, she, 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 doesn't, she doesn't say that to me now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what cream I use. Um, do, please. And me. Well, I, I suppose I, I do look at my life of, you know, the years I've been using to the years that I've been clean. Um, mm. I outweigh those years of using um, the 24th of December this year. Um, I can't wait to look at the 15 years of using and the 15 years of being clean. Wow. It's going to be a powerful moment for me. Um, so I thrive in that. Um, I can be quite obsessive to those particular dates. It's like a, my birthday celebration and it's a yeah, victory. Why not? Absolutely. You know, but um, it sure is. I'm 48 this year. Um, my kids have fully grown. Beautiful up. age, if you don't mind me saying so. <laughs> Do you know, so I'm like, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I know it is, and I may still identify as 26. But yeah, yes, same. I know <laughs> it feels significantly younger, yeah. merely 47. <laughs> He is bloody well 47. (laughs) So annoying. A lot of significant younger. Irritating. Um, But, you know, and Paul is gone there now. But Paul, like for somebody who was one of the first people there to stick a needle in their arm in this city, I would imagine there's few of them that's still alive that are still alive today. And I'd be one of them. Mm. And I'd be one of them. Mm. And that's why I say the gratitude of what a life transformation and what you can do in your journey when you put the walk in, you know. Um, I've had some beautiful times where there was a time I was in a shop um, and I bumped into the governor of, well, she's the governor today of the women's prison, but at the time she was still a prison officer. And I literally was brave enough to walk over and tip her on mm. the shoulders because she made a massive impact on me now when I was in the prison many years ago. And um, she turned and you know looked at me and she said to me we thought you were dead and that was a profound moment for me because and i said why straight away i came back with the why and she's because you never came back into prison oh, really? because she didn't know mm. i'd got well and i said there you are mm. Do you know there's mm-hmm. a piece where they don't always see that 
yeah. you know, they don't see someone see the, the miracle like, happen. The mir- yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. And that's it. So I definitely feel like a miracle. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're here. And uh, anybody who wants to see you. And I suppose the story of ecstasy, the story of heroin, the story of cocaine, the story of our city and the development of organized crime around the drug use in our city. Mm-hmm. Like Narcos, it, it is actually Dublin Narcos. Never mm. thought it'd be made myself, but mm. there you go. We've we've hit the big time here in Dublin. Yes, yeah. Um, and we're on this now, but it's it's a great show. So thank yeah. you so much for coming in. Thanks for having me on. Thanks, thank Jess. you so much.